What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another video of Elite Fantasy Hoops with me, Mike Zakarian. And today, we're repping a Tom Wamsgam shirt. Great one. Felt like I needed to address the aggressive pink right off the bat. If this is your first time checking out the channel, do us a favor, hit the subscribe button, smash the little notification bell so you know when that sweet, sweet content is dropping. And today, we are ranking the top 20 big men in the NBA, of course, when it comes to the fantasy world. And if you're like, hey, Mike, I don't want to start with the bigs. Where are the guards and the wings? Well, good news. Those videos went up in the last couple of weeks, so go check those out. But in this video, we are going to spend less than a minute on every single player in the top 20. Now, reminder, I'm not just saying these are the best bigs in the game. I'm saying they're the best bigs in the fantasy game. So Celtics fans, relax if Al Horford's not on the list. Now, to determine position eligibility, we're using underdog's double dribble positions. So if you see a big on this list that you're like, hey, he's a wing, well, it's because underdog has him listed as a big. But hopefully this information will be helpful as you bulk up your so rare rosters you draft your nba best ball or get ready for your redraft or dynasty drafts all right enough of the business up top let's get into it we are starting with the brooklyn nets big man nick Claxton. Now, Claxton is coming off a season with the Nets where he averaged 12 points and 10 rebounds. Now, Claxton making the top 20 honestly says more about how quickly this position drops off than anything else, because I don't think I'm a huge fan of the fantasy upside of Nick Claxton heading into this year, just because I really don't know what the Brooklyn Nets are going to be doing. They have no incentive to win. We saw Mikel Bridges go across the Brooklyn Bridge. He is now a part of the New York Knicks, and the roster's just super weird. Is Ben Simmons going to play? Is Dennis Schroeder really leading point guard? Will Cam Thomas average a thousand shot attempts per game? So I think Nick Claxton is fine. If he's going to give you a double double night in and night out, that's consistency we can count on. But I don't think I'd want him to be my main big. He's a good number two big on whatever type of roster you're building out. And we've honestly already talked about the Nets too much. So let's move right on to number 19. It's the Phoenix Suns big man, the hands of stone himself, Yusuf Nurkic. Nurk coming off a pretty productive season for the Phoenix Suns, averaging a double double with 10 points, 11 boards, and also up to four dimes. Now, Nurk Nurkic can be infuriating because he's not super consistent from the free throw line, and my god, he loves to miss those bunny shots. But in that high-powered, high-octane offense of the Phoenix Suns with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, Tyus Jones running the point now, Nurkic should find him way into easy buckets, easy putbacks, and he is going to rebound the heck out of the ball because he's the only man on the roster that can rebound. In Underdog's Best Ball Tournament, Nurkic is currently going 83rd overall, which feels a little bit rich, but to me, he's the last consistently producing big man that you can draft. Now, this next big comes in at 18, and it's only if he's properly salting his driveway come winter time. And that's the Portland big man, DeAndre Ayton, who famously missed the game because he couldn't get out of his driveway because it was too icy. Now, Ayton's in a weird situation, sort of similar to Nick Claxton and the Brooklyn Nets, where the Portland Trailblazers have zero incentive to win. They also have a ton of big dudes, right? They've got the Time Lord, Robert Williams. We don't know how healthy he is. They just drafted the big man, Donovan Klingon. But Aiden, especially down the stretch of the second half of the year, was dominant. He finished the season averaging a double-double of 16 points and 11 rebounds a game. And he falls into this weird category for me in the fantasy space where if I have DeAndre Aiden, I want him to be my second big because I think he can absolutely carry you for the first half of the season. But I think once we hit that February All-Star break and Portland's like, hey, let's bring out the tank, I don't know how much DeAndre Aiden's going to be playing the second half of the year. So I want to make sure we have some bigs ready to go to replace that production. Number 17, the Indiana Pacers big man, Miles Turner. In my fantasy career, I feel like I never get Miles Turner right, especially in the daily fantasy streets. When I'm overweight on Miles Turner, he gives me a dud. When I fade Miles Turner, he gets six blocks in the first half. But Miles is coming off a season where he averaged 17 and 7 and clearly has a good rhythm with Tyrese Halliburton. The addition of Pascal Siakam only made things easier for Turner down the stretch. And I don't know, call me crazy. I think it's okay to target teams that that don't play defense, but play a ton of offense. Even though I mentioned how inconsistent Miles Turner can be night to night, on a whole, in season-long type formats, Miles Turner is a very safe pick. And I don't think I would want him to be the first center on my team. I don't want to be completely relying on him, but if he's my second big, I feel very comfortable. Number 16 is maybe my favorite upside pick, and that's the Detroit Pistons' Jalen Duren. Jalen Duren, yet another big man that averaged a double-double last year with 13 points and 11 rebounds, but what got me excited was his production those first couple of weeks of the NBA season last year where he was dropping these massive 20-point double-double performances. They finally got rid of Monty Williams. They've got new energy in there. They've got a healthy Cade Cunningham to start the season. Maybe Jaden Ivey plays more regularly, and I just think Jalen Duren can consistently get us to 
maybe 18 and 13 this season. And I feel like that's going to be his floor with room to grow even more, especially if he gets that interior passing up a little bit and maybe his assists trickle up to like three, four a game. We made it to the top 15 and this one I feel the least confident about. And if this was a deeper position, I would have gladly left him off the top 20, but it's the Chicago Bulls big man, Nikola Vucevic. Now Vucevic came off a season where he averaged 18 and 10. You're like, hey, that's pretty good. That's a double double. However, his three point field goal percentage for a career, he averages just under 35%. This past season, he was sub 30%. The three point shot fell off an absolute cliff. Now you could be glass half full and say, hey, this is a small sample size. If he was averaging 18 and 10 while shooting sub 30% from three, maybe the shot comes back and now he's averaging 24 and 10, Mike, come on. Or you could be a negative Nancy like myself and be like, maybe this is the beginning of the end of the Vucci three point threat. And it's the Bulls. I don't know what they're doing heading into the season. Or I don't know who's going to be on this team. So honestly, I'm going to do my best to steer clear of Vooch. So even though I have him ranked 15th overall for the big man, I'm probably going to be clicking Jalen Dern or Miles Turner before I click Vooch. If you watch the Olympics, the number 14 man might scare you a little bit because he could barely play for the French team, although maybe he was hurt. But it's the Minnesota Timberwolves big Rudy, Rudy Gobert. The reigning defensive player of the year also averaged a double-double last season. Are you seeing the trend of 14 points and 12 boards. Now, Rudy's nice because he's also going to throw some stocks in there. You'll get some blocks. You'll get some steals. And he actually feels pretty consistent. Rudy feels like a nice, safe, pick. If you're taking one of these top elite bigs early on in your draft, and then you're able to get Rudy later on, I'm very comfortable with those being your two bigs for the entirety of the NBA season, depending on the format of the league that you're playing in. And if he's your first big that you're going to take, I just want to make sure I'm getting two or three more bigs. Number 13, we have the Cleveland Cavalier big man. Which one is it? Jared Allen. Jared Allen provides a workman-like consistency. And I know we might forget some of it because he missed a ton of time in the playoffs. There was a lot of rumblings about should he play. Allen last year averaged 16 points, 10 boards, three dimes, and then also would sprinkle in a block and steal here and there. So a lot of what we've seen here, specifically in the range of 15 to 10, is just consistency from that position. Maybe not a ton of upside, but they're not going to kill you either. Number 12 has some room for upside as well, and that is the Memphis Grizzlies big, not Zach Eady, but Jaron Jackson Jr. The Triple J averaged 22 and five last season, but last season was kind of an anomaly for the Memphis Grizzlies, right? They were just in injury hell with John Morant missing most of the season. Marcus Smart got there and he got hurt. Bain was in and out of the lineup. So Jaron Jackson Jr.'s field goal percentage might have gone into the ringer because he was required to do so much offensively. But I imagine we see a more efficient Triple J this season because the shots are going to come a lot easier with Ja, Smart, Bain all back on the floor now. And with the drafting of the big man, Zach Eady, I think we'll see Triple J play a little bit more of the four and hopefully stay out of that foul trouble because if he can, his upside is on the defensive end. He is a block god. Number 11, we're going back to Minnesota. It's the other big man, not named Nas Reed, but Carl Anthony Towns. I think it's important for people to put their personal feelings of Towns aside. I know we see some weird comments and clips from him, especially in the playoff run of the Timberwolves last season, but Towns is coming off a year where he averaged 21 points and eight boards, along with three assists a game. The Timberwolves offense really started to click last season. I feel like we're just going to see more of the same from Towns. I don't know if we have upside higher than what we saw in like a 21-8-3 and three performance, especially with Ant-Man ascending, but he's still a fine big man click. Number 10, the other Cleveland big man, Evan Mobes. Evan Mobley. Now again, this is a bet on upside. Maybe I got too excited from what I saw him do to the Boston Celtics in the playoffs when the Cavs ultimately fell in five games, but Mobley just looked like a different guy. They've got Kenny Atkinson in there now who knows how to coach up his bigs, and he's coming off a season where he averaged 15 points, nine boards, four dimes, and of course he throws in some blocks and steals here and there as well. Now maybe this is just my personal bias. I'm too in on Evan Mobley, and I feel like we're about to see a ceiling season from him. So this might be the most controversial one of putting him ahead of guys like Carl Anthony Towns, Jaron Jackson Jr., maybe even his teammate Jaron Allen, but I'm believing we're seeing ceiling Evan Mobley this year. Number nine, the OKC second year guy who also finished second in rookie of the year, Chet Holmgren. Now, if you're in the underdog streets and you're doing best ball, you're going to be like, wow, Mike, you have Chet Holmgren ninth overall? Because according to underdog, is the sixth big coming off the board and going 19th overall. And listen, before the hashtag Thunder Up community comes at me, I'm pro Chet Holmgren. I'm a big Thunder fan. I'm a big Chet Holmgren fan. I think he's going to have an awesome year this year. And heck, he's coming off a rookie season where he averaged 16 points, eight boards, two dimes, and like three blocks per game. And I'm sure going into his second year, he's going to take a little bit of leap as well. But I don't think I can just 
justify taking him ahead of some of the other bigs that we're going to talk about, mainly because of how the OKC offense works. They also have the addition of the former Knicks big man, Isaiah Hartenstein, who again, I think they probably end up playing together for minutes. Isaiah at the five, Chet at the four, then Chet plays the five and Isaiah's on the bench. So who knows? Maybe I can eat my words here, but I just think the draft capital is a little too rich for Chet Holmgren right now. But I'll be curious to hear from you. So let me know in the chat. Do you think I have Chet way too low here? Now, the next couple names I rattle off, would you prefer to take them over Chet or Chet over them? Well, let's keep it moving. Number eight, Heat culture, Bammy out of bio, baby. Bam is such a peculiar fantasy basketball player because the highs are oh so high. And then he'll be in these smash spots where you think he'd absolutely dominate. And then he takes like four field goal attempts. It's absolutely infuriating to sweat. But that being said, we already know he's a defensive mastermind. And offensively last season, he averaged 19 points, 10 boards, and four dimes. And hey, maybe Jimmy Butler plays more than 50 regular season games this year. Maybe Miami has a bounce back regular season. And maybe Bam takes what he learned in the Olympics and starts balling out. I'm also a little intrigued at the idea of Khalil Ware, their rookie, playing a little bit at the five and Bam plays at the four. I don't know if they're actually going to do that, but I'm intrigued. Number seven, the Turk from the Houston Rockets, Alpi Shengun. Before Shengun went down with that injury, he averaged 21 points, nine boards, and five dimes, was an offensive menace for the Rockets. My only concern with Shengun is that I don't know how Houston feels about him. There were these rumblings that maybe Shengun was going to get moved in the offseason, that he didn't mesh well with Udoka. And people will point to the Houston Rockets record, how they went on this tear at the end of the season where they almost caught the Golden State Warriors for the 10th seed, and they're like, oh, but they did all that with Shengun. And yes, Houston had a couple really nice wins in there, and it's hard to go on any sort of winning streak in the NBA. But look at the schedule. Before we start bad-mouthing Shingu. Shingun is only 22 years old, coming into his own, and I feel like the best is yet to come, so I'm in on the Shingun train. Coming in at number six is a little scary because you're going to ask, how many games is he going to play? Although, he's coming off a season where he played 70 games, but he did get hurt right before the playoffs. It's the New Orleans big man, Zion Williamson. Now, you might be thinking, hey, Zion's not a big. Okay, but an underdog he is, so just go with me. Zion was awesome last year, averaging 23 points, five boards, five dimes a game. And the Pelicans added DeJounte Murray in the offseason. They still don't actually have a big man. They drafted Eves Missy, the Baylor rookie. I think Daniel Tice is the other big listed at the roster. So I think we're going to see point center Zion, point forward Zion. I don't know if he's in the gym or in the Ozempic lab, but he looks great. He's slimmed down. Maybe that's less pressure on the joints and on the hammies. He's going to stay healthy. Ceiling season Zion incoming. Now I have Zion as the sixth big overall. He's currently getting drafted at pick 31 in underdog. I fall into this trap every season, but I'm pro Zion. Number five, we call him Jokic Light, Domas Sabonis, Light the Beam. Bone Bone coming off of a near Jokic season with 19 points, 13 boards, and eight dimes per game. Kings did a weird thing, though, by adding DeMar DeRozan to the roster. I don't really know how that's going to impact the offense. I know I talked about DeMar in our Top 20 Wings video, which you should check out after this if you haven't. But I'm pro DeRozan as a hooper. He is an absolute bucket getter. But the Kings are famous for playing this high-flying offense with Fox, Monk, Keegan Murray, Sabonis. And now throwing in DeRozan's game, it's a little bit different. I wonder if it slows down a little. But Sabonis should have no problem continuing to get his numbers. Number four, the gold medalist, the Los Angeles Laker, Anthony Davis. Davis got a little Zion in him where you're like, hey, but how many games is he really going to play? Well, he's coming off a season where he played 76 games. He was averaging 24 points over 12 boards and over three dimes per game. Of course, he'd have those massive block games as well. Anthony Davis, truly a fantasy god last season. AD's been going anywhere between 8th and 12th on underdog. I'm a big fan of getting overweight on Anthony Davis. Some people might be like, hey, yeah, sure, he played 76 games last year. Is he going to do that again? Well, listen, if you're scared of injuries, you're also going to be scared of number 3 because that is the former MVP, the 76er, Joel Embiid. Embiid only played 40 games last season, but in those 40 games, averaged 34 points, 11 boards, 5 dimes. We saw him drop a 70 piece on the San Antonio Spurs. But the biggest concern with Embiid is how often can he stay on the court? Are the 76ers finally going to come to their senses where they're like, hey, we don't need to care about the regular season. We just need to have Embiid healthy as we head to the playoffs. And maybe by, by adding players like a Paul George, by all those other role players they picked up, they can take some of the pressure off of their big man to do so much of the offensive lifting early in the season. However, we've all known this the whole time and they've yet to do it. 
So yes, the ceiling of a Joel Embiid is he could finish first overall in fantasy scoring. But the floor is that he plays 35 to 45 games and then just kills your team. Some people might boo me here for number two because they think he should be number one. And I know it's the sexy, exciting pick to say we're taking him number one overall. And that's the San Antonio Spurs big man, Victor Wembenyama, coming in at number two. Wemby coming off a bonkers rookie season where he averaged 21 points, 10 boards, four dimes. Also like throwing in four blocks a game. The Spurs also added a point guard that knows how to passing the ball. No disrespect, Trey Jones, but a little disrespect in Chris Paul. However, Chris Paul is my age, so who knows how many games he's going to play. But I get it. I think what we've seen from Wemby, even in France, what we saw in the Olympics is that Wemby is going to have a monster ceiling. And, and I'm sure in no time he is going to be my number one pick overall. But I think right now I'm going to keep him at number two, which shouldn't be disrespect because this isn't just the number two big man overall, but this is the number two pick overall for me. And I imagine we see him average something like 25 12. Maybe the assist numbers go up. We know that he's got the blocks and steals that are through the roof. But my one concern is like, are the Spurs going to be trying again at the end of the season? I know they added Chris Paul, but they could absolutely trade Chris Paul as well. Maybe they want to tank one more time down the stretch. Maybe they try to stay as competitive as long as they can and then pull the ripcord. But truly, we're splitting hairs with number two and number one. I think I'm taking maybe the safer route with my number one pick as we get into the three-time MVP, the reigning MVP, Nikola Jokic, where I'm, con I'm confident that Jokic is going to put up these numbers. Last season, he average 26 points 12 boards and nine dimes he's gonna do that night in and night out so yes i do think the heights of Wemby could surpass nikola Jokic, but for season long i'm gonna take the safety and security of a guy that's just gonna average a triple double every single night i can't believe it feels like a hot take to say nikola Jokic, the three-time mvp is the number one overall pick ahead of Wemby, but it feels a little spicy because people have injected Wemby yama right into their veins rightfully so. so there you have it the top 20 bigs heading into this nba season let me know what was the the biggest screw up I had in this list. What did you agree with? And again, if you've made it this far without subscribing to the channel, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, smash the little notification bell so you know when the content's going live, and then go check out our top 20 wings and top 20 guards video. Thanks for watching.